It was just another day for Judge Anthony Myers, a distinguished black judge known for his commitment to justice and fairness. As he approached the courthouse, where he was scheduled to preside over a high-profile case on racial discrimination in a prison system, his mind was focused. This case was particularly sensitive, with the media already swarming around the front entrance. To avoid the frenzy, he chose to enter through the side door, as he often did when he wanted a quieter start to his day. Dressed in his usual dark suit, carrying his briefcase, Anthony walked with confidence. The weight of the trial ahead rested on his shoulders, but he was no stranger to pressure. His career had been built on navigating difficult cases, especially those touching on issues of racial injustice. As he neared the courthouse, he noticed a new security presence, which was unusual but not alarming given the nature of the trial. The tension was already thick in the air, and Anthony braced himself for what would undoubtedly be a long day. Little did he know, the real challenge would come before he even stepped inside the courthouse. As Judge Myers approached the side entrance, he was stopped by a young white police officer standing guard. Excuse me, sir, the officer said, stepping forward with a hand raised. I'm going to need to see some identification. Anthony paused, surprised by the sudden interruption. He wasn't used to being stopped at the courthouse, especially not here, where he had worked for years. With a calm smile, Anthony reached for the lanyard around his neck, displaying his courthouse ID with the word judge clearly printed on it. I'm Judge Myers, he said politely. I'm presiding over a case this morning. But the officer, whose name tag read Davis, didn't even glance at the ID. Instead, his eyes scanned Anthony from head to toe, suspicion clear in his expression. There's been some suspicious activity nearby, Davis said firmly, and you match the description. Anthony's smile faded slightly. I'm due in court in less than 10 minutes, he said, his tone still measured. But Davis stepped closer, his hand resting on his belt. I'll need to ask you a few more questions, he said, his voice hardening. Please cooperate. The situation escalated quickly. Anthony's patience, though vast from years of dealing with difficult courtroom scenarios, was being tested. He took a deep breath, reminding himself of his position. Officer, he began again, this time with more authority. I am the presiding judge in one of the courtrooms here. I don't have time for this. Please check my ID. But Officer Davis wasn't backing down. His eyes narrowed and his posture became more rigid. I don't care who you say you are. Davis replied, his tone cold. I have to do my job. Now turn around and put your hands where I can see them. Anthony couldn't believe what he was hearing. A knot formed in his stomach, and a surge of anger rose within him. He had seen and read about this type of racial profiling, but never imagined it would happen to him, right outside the very courthouse where he was about to preside over a case on racial injustice. For a brief moment, the world around Anthony seemed to slow down. He could feel the weight of the irony crushing him. Here he was, a judge, about to be treated like a criminal because of the color of his skin. But he knew he had to remain calm. Officer, Anthony said again, his voice steady but firm, you are making a mistake. Just as the situation seemed ready to spiral out of control, another voice broke through the tension. Officer Davis, the voice was commanding, and both Anthony and Davis turned to see Sergeant Michael Harris a senior black officer, approaching quickly. His eyes darted between Anthony and Davis, immediately recognizing the judge. What are you doing? Harris demanded, his voice filled with both disbelief and urgency. Davis blinked, confused by his superior's tone. He fits the description of the suspect we're looking for, Davis explained, gesturing vaguely toward Anthony. But Harris wasn't having it. That's Judge Myers, he said sharply. He's not a suspect. He's the man presiding over the very case you're supposed to be guarding today. Stand down, officer. Davis's face flushed with embarrassment, but there was still a flicker of defiance in his eyes. Sergeant Harris turned to Anthony, his expression softening with respect and apology. Judge Myers, I'm sorry about this. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. Anthony gave a tight nod, grateful for Harris's intervention, but the sting of the moment still lingered. Thank you, Sergeant he said quietly. Without another word, he straightened his jacket and walked into the courthouse, the weight of the encounter hanging over him. Once inside, Anthony made his way through the familiar, sterile hallways of the courthouse. His footsteps echoed against the marble floors, but today they felt heavier.
No matter how hard he tried to shake off the encounter at the entrance, it clung to him like a shadow. The courthouse, a place where justice was supposed to prevail, now felt tainted by the experience. As he entered his chambers to prepare for the trial, Anthony's mind kept replaying the scene outside. The arrogance in Officer Davis's voice, the assumption that he could be a criminal just because he fit the description. It was a scenario that too many black men had faced, and now it had happened to him, a judge. The irony was bitter, and it was hard not to let it affect him as he reviewed the files for the day's trial. But Anthony was a professional. He knew he had to put his emotions aside and focus on the case at hand. He closed his eyes for a moment, took a deep breath, and reminded himself of his duty. In the courtroom, he had to remain impartial and steady, no matter how personal the subject matter had become. The courtroom was already packed when Judge Myers entered, his black robe flowing behind him as he took his seat at the bench. The air was thick with anticipation. The case, one involving the racial profiling of a young black man by the local police, had attracted significant media attention. The prosecutor, a sharp and relentless attorney named Rachel Diaz, was already standing at her desk, ready to present her case. All rise, the bailiff announced, and the courtroom stood as Anthony sat at the bench, his gavel resting firmly in his hand. As he scanned the room, his eyes momentarily rested on the defense table, where several police officers sat, including Officer Jake Williams, who was accused of racial profiling. Anthony's heart skipped a beat when he noticed a familiar face sitting at the back of the courtroom. Officer Davis, the same man who had stopped him that morning. For a moment, their eyes met. Davis shifted uncomfortably, clearly recognizing Anthony as the judge. Anthony quickly turned his attention back to the trial, but the weight of the morning's events continued to press down on him. He had to remain impartial, even as the trial in front of him mirrored the injustice he had experienced just hours earlier. The first witness called to the stand was the young black man who had been wrongfully detained by Officer Williams. His name was Darnell Johnson, and as he took the stand, the room seemed to quiet even more. Darnell was in his late 20s, with a soft-spoken demeanor, but there was a weight behind his words that commanded attention. Mr. Johnson, the prosecutor began, can you describe what happened on the night of your arrest? Darnell took a deep breath, his eyes fixed on the floor for a moment before he spoke. I was walking home from a friend's house, he said, his voice steady but filled with an underlying tension. I was almost at my door when two officers pulled up and started asking me questions. They didn't say why, they just assumed I was up to something. As Darnell recounted the details of his arrest, Anthony felt a lump form in his throat. The story was all too familiar, stopped without reason, questioned without justification, and arrested based on nothing more than a gut feeling that he didn't belong. It was a narrative Anthony had heard before, but today it hit closer to home than ever. Your Honor, the prosecution would like to call Officer Jake Williams to the stand, Rachel Diaz announced. Anthony's pulse quickened slightly. This was the officer at the center of the case, the man accused of profiling Darnell Johnson and arresting him without cause. Officer Williams, a middle-aged white man with a stern expression, stood up from the defense table and made his way to the witness stand. As he swore to tell the truth, Anthony watched him closely, noticing the nervous twitch in his hand as he raised it. The courtroom fell into a tense silence as the prosecutor began her questioning. Officer Williams, she started, can you explain why you stopped Mr. Johnson that night? Williams cleared his throat, shifting uncomfortably in his seat. We received a call about suspicious activity in the area, he said, his voice steady but lacking confidence. When we arrived, we saw Mr. Johnson near a vehicle, and he looked out of place. Out of place. The words hung in the air like a bad odor. Anthony's fingers tightened around his gavel as he listened. He had heard this excuse too many times in cases like these. Someone being out of place was often just a euphemism for racial profiling. He kept his face neutral, but inside he was boiling. Rachel Diaz was relentless in her cross-examination of Officer Williams. Out of place, you say, she repeated, her voice dripping with skepticism. And what exactly made Mr. Johnson look out of place? Williams hesitated, his gaze flickering toward the defense attorney for reassurance. Well, he seemed nervous. He was looking around like he didn't belong there. Diaz raised an eyebrow. So let me get this straight. A black man standing in a predominantly white neighborhood 
Made you assume he was suspicious? William shifted in his seat, clearly uncomfortable. It wasn't just that, he stammered. He didn't give a clear reason for being there. The prosecutor's eyes narrowed. Perhaps because he didn't feel the need to justify walking in his own neighborhood? The tension in the room was palpable as Diaz continued to press Williams on his actions that night. Anthony watched closely, his own emotions swirling beneath the surface. He had to remain impartial, but it was hard not to feel a personal connection to the story unfolding in front of him. The officer's justifications were unraveling, and Anthony could see the truth coming to light. As the cross-examination continued, the pressure mounted on Officer Williams. Rachel Diaz wasn't letting up, and the inconsistencies in his story were becoming more apparent with each question. So you detained Mr. Johnson because he looked suspicious, Diaz said, her tone sharp. But did you have any actual evidence that he had committed a crime? Williams faltered, his face flushing. No, but we had reasonable suspicion, he insisted, though the conviction in his voice was fading. Reasonable suspicion, Diaz echoed, her voice laced with sarcasm. And what exactly was suspicious about a man standing near a car, unarmed, and doing nothing illegal? The silence in the room was deafening as William struggled to respond. Finally, he muttered, we made a mistake. It was a small admission, but it was enough. The room seemed to exhale collectively, and Anthony felt a wave of validation wash over him. The truth was coming out, and with it, the system that allowed these mistakes to happen was being exposed. As Officer Williams stepped down from the witness stand, his face pale and his confidence shattered, Anthony couldn't help but reflect on the bitter irony of the situation. Here was a man who had profiled a black man based on a gut feeling, the same man who had stopped and questioned him just hours earlier outside the courthouse. The parallels were impossible to ignore, and yet Anthony knew he had to push aside his personal feelings. Sitting at the bench, he remained composed, even as his mind raced with thoughts about the systemic injustice he had witnessed both inside and outside the courtroom. Officer Williams had cracked under pressure, but the problem ran deeper than one man's actions. This was about a culture that allowed racial bias to persist, unchecked and unchallenged. For Anthony, the trial wasn't just about Darnell Johnson anymore. It was about every black person who had been stopped, questioned and humiliated simply for existing in a space where others thought they didn't belong. The weight of that realization was heavy, but Anthony knew he had to carry it. His role as a judge demanded nothing less. As the trial continued, Anthony couldn't help but notice the jurors' reactions. Some seemed to be following the prosecutor's argument closely, their expressions hardening as the evidence of racial bias mounted. Others, however, appeared conflicted, their faces tense as they listened to the defense's attempts to paint Officer Williams as a man simply doing his job under difficult circumstances. The jury's role was crucial in this case. They would have to decide whether Officer Williams had acted out of racial bias or if he had genuinely believed Darnell Johnson was a threat. Anthony knew how difficult that decision could be. Bias was often invisible, even to those who harbored it. But the facts of the case were clear. Mr. Johnson had been wrongfully detained based on nothing more than a feeling that he didn't belong. Anthony had seen enough cases like this to know that the jury's decision could go either way. He hoped that the weight of the evidence and the clear flaws in Officer Williams' testimony would lead them to the right conclusion. But in a world where justice was often elusive, hope wasn't always enough. As the defense attorney rose to make his closing argument, the tension in the room was palpable. Richard Fuller, a seasoned attorney with a calm demeanor, approached the jury with a look of confidence. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he began, his voice smooth and measured. We've heard a lot of talk about racial profiling in this case, but let's not forget the facts. He paced in front of the jury, his hands clasped behind his back. Officer Williams was responding to a call. He saw behavior that, in his experience, was suspicious. He made a split-second decision to investigate further. And yes, perhaps mistakes were made. But that doesn't mean he was acting out of racial bias. Fuller's words were carefully chosen, and Anthony could see the jurors' expressions shifting slightly as they listened. But we cannot hold our police officers to an impossible standard, Fuller continued. They have to make quick decisions in the interest of public safety. And in this case, Officer Williams was doing just that. 
He made a judgment call, and while it may not have been perfect, it was done with the best intentions. Fuller returned to his seat, his argument delivered with precision. Now it was up to the jury. Rachel Diaz stood up, her face calm but determined. She walked slowly to the center of the courtroom, letting the silence linger for a moment before she began. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what we have seen here today is not just about one officer making a mistake. This is about a pattern of behavior, a pattern that has allowed racial bias to go unchecked for far too long. She paused, her eyes scanning the jury. Mr. Johnson was stopped, detained, and humiliated, not because he was doing anything wrong, but because he didn't fit in. He didn't fit into Officer Williams's idea of who should be walking in that neighborhood. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the very definition of racial profiling. Her words were sharp, and Anthony could see their impact on the jury. We entrust our police officers with the responsibility to protect us all, Diaz continued, her voice rising slightly. But that trust is broken when they act on bias rather than evidence. Today, you have the power to hold Officer Williams accountable for his actions. You have the power to say that enough is enough. With that, she returned to her seat, the weight of her argument hanging in the air. The jury was dismissed to deliberate, and the courtroom slowly began to empty. As Anthony sat at the bench, he couldn't help but feel the gravity of the moment. The case had laid bare the deep-seated issues of racial bias within the police force, and now it was up to the jury to decide whether justice would be served. As the jurors filed out, Anthony's thoughts drifted back to his own experience with Officer Davis that morning. The sting of that encounter still lingered, and it was hard not to draw parallels between his situation and Darnell Johnson's. Both had been judged based on appearance. Both had been stopped because they didn't belong. The difference was that Anthony had the privilege of his position to shield him. Darnell did not. The wait for the jury's verdict felt like an eternity. Anthony knew that no matter the outcome, the fight against racial injustice was far from over. But today, in this courtroom, there was a chance for a small step toward accountability, and that was something worth hoping for. After hours of deliberation, the jury finally returned with their verdict. The courtroom was silent as the foreman stood, holding the small slip of paper that would determine the outcome of the case. Anthony's heart pounded in his chest as he motioned for her to speak. We find the defendant, Officer Jake Williams, guilty of wrongful arrest and racial discrimination. A murmur spread through the courtroom, and Anthony felt a wave of relief wash over him. The verdict had been reached. Justice, at least in this case, had been served. He looked over at Officer Williams, whose face had drained of all color. The weight of the jury's decision was clearly sinking in, and for a moment his eyes met Anthony's, filled with a mix of regret and resignation. Anthony raised his gavel, preparing to formally dismiss the court, but just as he was about to bring it down, Officer Williams stood up, his voice trembling. Your Honor, he said, his voice cracking. I, I just want to say I'm sorry. The courtroom fell into a stunned silence as Officer Williams' words echoed through the room. All eyes turned to him, and Anthony felt his chest tighten. I didn't mean for any of this to happen, Williams continued, his voice filled with emotion. I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was protecting the community. But I see now that I wasn't. I see now that I was wrong. Anthony stared at Williams, his heart pounding. He had waited for this moment, for some acknowledgement of the harm that had been done. But now that it was here, he wasn't sure how to feel. Williams' apology was unexpected, and yet it felt too late. The damage had already been done, not just to Darnell Johnson, but to countless others who had been victims of the same system. I'm sorry for what I did, Williams said quietly, his eyes filled with regret to Mr. Johnson, and to you, Your Honor. Anthony's grip on the gavel tightened. He wanted to believe the apology was sincere, but he knew that words alone couldn't undo the harm that had been caused. Still, there was a part of him that wanted to forgive, not for Williams's sake, but for his own. Anthony took a deep breath, his eyes locked on Williams. Your apology is noted, Officer Williams, he said, his voice calm but firm but this court will now adjourn. With a final bang of the gavel, the trial was officially over. The courtroom began to empty, but Anthony remained seated for a moment, staring at the now empty witness stand where so much had unfolded. He had done his job.
Justice had been served, at least in this instance. But Anthony knew that this was just one case, one small victory in a much larger fight. The system that allowed racial profiling and discrimination to persist was still very much in place, and the fight to dismantle it was far from over. As he stood to leave the courtroom, Anthony felt a sense of resolve settle over him. Today had been a step in the right direction, but there were more battles to come. He knew that the road to justice was long and difficult, but he was committed to walking it, both as a judge and as a black man who had seen firsthand the impact of racial injustice. As Anthony walked back to his chambers, the weight of the trial still heavy on his shoulders, he couldn't help but reflect on the responsibility that came with his role. As a judge, he had the power to make decisions that could change lives, but with that power came immense pressure. The events of the day had reminded him just how deeply embedded racial bias was in the system he was sworn to uphold. Sitting at his desk, Anthony pulled out a pen and paper, jotting down his thoughts. He often found solace in writing, a way to process the complexities of the cases he presided over. Today's trial had been particularly challenging, not just because of the subject matter, but because of the personal connection he felt to it. He had experienced the very injustice he was tasked with addressing in the courtroom. But despite the challenges, Anthony knew that he couldn't let his emotions cloud his judgment. He had a duty to remain impartial, to ensure that justice was served fairly and without bias. It was a delicate balance, one that he had mastered over the years. But today, that balance had been tested like never before. As Anthony sat in his chambers, lost in thought, there was a knock on the door. Come in, he called and Sergeant Michael Harris, the senior officer who had intervened at the courthouse door earlier that morning, stepped inside. His face was lined with concern, but there was a sense of resolve in his posture. Judge Myers, he said quietly, I wanted to talk to you about what happened today. Anthony gestured for him to sit. His curiosity peaked. Go ahead, Sergeant, he replied. Harris sighed, running a hand over his face. Look, I know Officer Davis made a mistake this morning. He's a good cop, but sometimes, sometimes he just doesn't think. Anthony raised an eyebrow, his skepticism clear. Doesn't think or doesn't care, he asked, his voice laced with frustration. Harris winced, clearly uncomfortable with the question. Maybe a little of both, he admitted. But what happened out there? It's part of a bigger problem. I've been trying to change things from the inside, but it's not easy. Anthony leaned back in his chair, studying Harris carefully. And what do you suggest I do, Sergeant? When I'm sitting up there in that courtroom, hearing case after case, knowing what I experienced firsthand? Harris was silent for a moment before replying, You keep doing what you're doing, Judge. You hold us accountable. That's the only way things are going to change. As Sergeant Harris left his chambers, Anthony sat back, reflecting on their conversation. Harris was right. What had happened that morning was part of a much larger, systemic problem. It wasn't just about one officer's actions or one wrongful arrest. It was about a culture that allowed racial profiling to persist, about a system that too often failed to hold people accountable. Anthony had seen the effects of that system firsthand, both in the courtroom and in his personal life. As a black man, he had experienced the subtle and not-so-subtle forms of racism that permeated society. But as a judge, he had the power to do something about it. He had the power to ensure that justice was served, not just for individuals like Darnell Johnson, but for everyone who had been wronged by the system. But it wasn't an easy fight. The forces of resistance were strong, and change came slowly. Anthony knew that his role as a judge was both a privilege and a burden. He had the power to make a difference, but with that power came immense responsibility, and that responsibility weighed heavily on him today. That evening, as Anthony sat in his office, the courthouse now empty and quiet, he allowed himself a moment of personal reflection. The events of the day had left him emotionally drained, and he knew that he needed time to process everything that had happened. He leaned back in his chair, staring up at the ceiling, the silence of the room offering a brief respite from the chaos of the trial. For the first time that day, Anthony allowed himself to feel the full weight of the racial profiling he had experienced that morning. It wasn't the first time he had been judged based on the color of his skin, but it was the first time it had happened so blatantly in a place where he was supposed to hold authority.
The irony was almost too much to bear. He had spent his entire career fighting for justice, and yet here he was, facing the very injustice he had sworn to combat. But Anthony knew that he couldn't let this experience break him. If anything, it only strengthened his resolve. He was more determined than ever to use his position to fight against the systemic racism that plagued the justice system. The road ahead would be long and difficult, but Anthony was ready for the challenge. He had no other choice. And the next morning, Anthony arrived at the courthouse with a renewed sense of purpose. The events of the previous day were still fresh in his mind, but he knew that he couldn't dwell on them for too long. There was more work to be done, more cases to hear, and more injustices to confront. The fight for justice never ended, and Anthony was ready to continue that fight. As he walked through the courthouse doors, he nodded to the security guards, who now greeted him with a mixture of respect and apology. Officer Davis was nowhere to be seen, and Anthony was grateful for that. He didn't need another reminder of what had happened the day before. He had already made peace with it, at least for now. But as he made his way to the courtroom, Anthony couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The system he was a part of was flawed, and it was his job to help fix it. It was a daunting task, but Anthony was not one to shy away from challenges. He had spent his entire life overcoming obstacles, and this was just another one to add to the list. The courtroom was buzzing with activity as Anthony took his seat at the bench, ready to hear the first case of the day. This time, it was a civil case involving a dispute over property rights, a far cry from the emotionally charged trial of the previous day. But even as the lawyers presented their arguments, Anthony's mind occasionally drifted back to the issue of racial bias. He knew that systemic racism didn't just manifest in criminal cases. It was present in every aspect of society, including the civil disputes he presided over. The fight for justice wasn't limited to one type of case. It was a battle that had to be fought on every front. Anthony listened carefully to the arguments being made, but he couldn't shake the feeling that there was still so much more work to be done. As the case progressed, Anthony remained focused, determined to give both parties a fair hearing. But in the back of his mind, the events of the previous day still lingered. The fight for justice was far from over, and Anthony knew that he had a role to play in that fight, both inside and outside the courtroom. As the civil case drew to a close, Anthony raised his gavel to deliver his ruling. The courtroom was silent as he spoke, his voice calm and measured. But as the words left his mouth, he couldn't help but feel the weight of the gavel in his hand. It was a symbol of his authority, a reminder of the power he held to make decisions that could change lives. But that power came with a heavy burden. Every decision he made had consequences, and Anthony was acutely aware of the impact his rulings could have. He had seen the effects of injustice firsthand, both in the cases he presided over and in his own life. And while the gavel represented justice, it also represented responsibility a responsibility that weighed heavily on Anthony's shoulders. As he brought the gavel down, officially closing the case, Anthony took a deep breath. The fight for justice wasn't easy, but it was a fight worth fighting. And as long as he held the gavel in his hand, he would continue to do everything in his power to ensure that justice was served. After the trial ended, Anthony made his way back to his chambers, eager for a moment of quiet reflection. As he sat down at his desk, there was a knock on the door. Come in, he called, and to his surprise, Darnell Johnson, the young man from the trial the day before, stepped into the room. He looked nervous but determined. Judge Myers, Darnell began, his voice soft but sincere. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for listening to me, for hearing my story, and for giving me justice. I know it's not easy, and I just wanted you to know how much it means to me. Anthony was taken aback by the young man's words, but he smiled warmly. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, he replied. I'm just doing my job, but I'm glad that you feel like justice was served. Darnell nodded, his eyes filled with gratitude. It was, he said simply, and I'll never forget it. With that, he turned and left the room, leaving Anthony alone with his thoughts. It was moments like this that reminded him why he had chosen this path. The fight for justice was never easy, but it was worth it. And for Anthony, that was enough. Later that afternoon, Anthony received an unexpected visitor, Officer Davis, the young white police officer who had stopped him outside the courthouse the day before.
Davis looked nervous as he stepped into Anthony's chambers, clearly unsure of how to proceed. Judge Myers, he began awkwardly, I just wanted to apologize for what happened yesterday. Anthony looked up from his desk, his expression neutral. Go on, he said, his voice calm but firm. Davis shifted uncomfortably. I didn't realize who you were, and I... I shouldn't have assumed anything. I was just trying to do my job, but I know I made a mistake. I'm sorry. There was sincerity in his voice, but Anthony wasn't sure if it was enough. For a long moment, Anthony said nothing, simply studying Davis's face. Finally, he spoke. You didn't make a mistake, Officer Davis, he said quietly. You made a choice, a choice based on assumptions and biases that you need to confront. But I appreciate your apology. Davis nodded, clearly relieved, but Anthony wasn't finished. Next time, he added, make a better choice. After Officer Davis left, Anthony sat back in his chair, reflecting on the events of the past two days. The fight for justice was never easy, but there were moments, small, fleeting moments, that gave him hope. Davis's apology, while imperfect, was a step in the right direction. It was a reminder that change, however slow, was possible. Anthony knew that the road ahead would be long and difficult. There would be more cases, more injustices to confront, and more battles to fight. But today, he allowed himself to feel a glimmer of hope. Hope that the system could change, that people could change, and that justice, in the end, would prevail. As he looked out the window at the city below, Anthony took a deep breath, feeling the weight of the past two days slowly lifting. The fight wasn't over, but for the first time in a long time, he felt ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Justice was a long and winding road, but Anthony was determined to walk it, no matter where it led. And the next morning, Anthony arrived at the courthouse with a renewed sense of resolve. The events of the past few days had tested him in ways he hadn't expected, but they had also strengthened his commitment to justice. As he walked through the courthouse doors, he nodded to the security guards who greeted him with respect. Today was a new day, and Anthony was ready to face whatever challenges it brought. He knew that the fight for justice was far from over, but he was determined to keep pushing forward. The road ahead was long, but Anthony was not one to shy away from difficult tasks. He had spent his entire career fighting for what was right, and he wasn't about to stop now. As he entered the courtroom, Anthony took a deep breath, feeling the weight of the gavel in his hand. It was a symbol of the power he held, but also of the responsibility that came with it. Today, he would use that power to continue fighting for justice, for himself, for Darnell Johnson, and for everyone who had been wronged by the system. As Anthony sat at the bench, ready to preside over the next case, he couldn't help but reflect on the journey he had taken to get here. The fight for justice was never easy, but it was a fight worth fighting. He had seen the effects of injustice firsthand, both in the courtroom and in his personal life. But despite the challenges, Anthony remained committed to his role as a judge. The gavel in his hand was more than just a tool. It was a symbol of his commitment to justice, to fairness, and to ensuring that everyone who came before him was treated with dignity and respect. The road ahead would be long and difficult, but Anthony was ready for whatever came next. As the courtroom filled with people, Anthony took a deep breath, feeling a sense of calm wash over him. The fight for justice was far from over, but today he was ready to continue that fight. And with the gavel in his hand, Anthony knew that he had the power to make a difference. One case at a time, one step at a time, the journey toward justice continued.